Oh, no, Lacal, my garden of roses. Let's spend some time talking about the Senate hearing, the Senate Intelligence Community hearing, on global world threats. Yesterday, the Senate Intelligence Committee held a hearing on threats the world over to the United States, an annual unclassified hearing in which the Director of National Intelligence, as well as the directors of the CIA, DIA, NSA, NGA, and FBI, present speeches on their perspective regarding threats to the United States and are open to questions by the Intelligence Committee. Due to the complexity of the issues addressed in this meeting, I'll be making multiple videos today and tomorrow on the subject, each one a mix scripted and off the cuff for easier digestion. And I assure you, none of this is going to be easy. Before we begin, I feel it important to be extremely clear about just what we're dealing with. Sitting before the panel are the six highest ranking members of the U.S. intelligence community. Six individuals whose training is in denial, distraction, distortion, and deflection, amongst many other skills. Despite the strong language many of them use with regards to China, Russia, Pakistan, and criminal organizations which sit at the center of their discussions, they are tireless in their ability to dodge questions at hand and instead speak to their own interests. Those being the interests of enhancing the power and tools held by their agency and their position in light of the strengths of our competitors and opponents around the world. I will do my damnedest to give you the most plain and simple explanation of these issues presented in such political and in some cases manipulative uses of language. But don't expect these videos to be easy listening in any way. Now we're going to start with China and North Korea, two countries that honestly, North Korea not so much, but China certainly is a place that we have some of the best intelligence on with regards to threats that are posed to our country. China is mostly deceptive, but they're not good at protecting themselves against espionage and counterespionage. Uh, North Korea, on the other hand, is very paranoid, and our intelligence there can be pretty weak at times. However, Kim Jong-un is young and pretty ignorant and lets a lot slip, especially in light of what we know about the Kim dynasty. So, I mean, when we get to that, I'll explain more. Despite Vice Chairman Mark Warner's attempts to bring the Russian hoax front and center, which I find completely ironic given his own connections with Russian, uh, with Russian diplomats, Russian paid lobbyists, etc. It is China and North Korea which take up most of the testimony given by the directors of the intelligence community in the first hour and a half. With China increasingly making use of their heavily state-funded and influenced telecommunications companies, Huawei and ZTE, to provide mobile phones and network infrastructure compromised with backdoors and spying tools to the American public, as well as the mounting evidence that the Chinese-funded Confucius Institutes in our universities and high schools, becoming far more about enforcing propaganda as curriculum in schools who take their generous investments rather than just teaching the Mandarin language and Chinese culture in the U.S. It is clear that the U.S. intelligence community is very concerned about how vulnerable our nation is to Chinese influence. In addition, the Chinese Belt and Road Project, an attempt to create a new Silk Road from China to Africa patrolled by the Chinese army, as well as an established Chinese-controlled overseas trade routes patrolled by the Chinese Navy, is increasingly appearing to not be entirely about trade, as Xi Jinping would have us believe, but rather spread military and business influence and ownership across Eurasia in a manner reminiscent of colonialist Britain, but far, far more insidious in nature. I've talked about the Belt and Road quite a lot, uh, especially last year when it was uh, getting a lot of attention. But I feel it's important to, to clarify that this is not going to be as simple as constructing a single major highway which stretches from Beijing to the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, no, this is going to be essentially creating 
their answer to American embassies and military bases across the world by having their own personal military controlled highway, which connects China, India, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, in uh, Iran, uh, Israel, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, and then stretching additional highways all throughout Africa, Africa being one of their one of the things that they own and no one seems to want to call them on. They own most of the resources in Africa right now, uh, Eastern Africa, I should say. They own a massive amount of resources. Uh, they own people in Africa. In so many words, they treat Africans essentially the same way they treat their own citizens, giving them severely underpaid and nearly slave-like jobs, and providing nothing other than, you know, the most minimal amount of money they can pay them in return for this work that they do. Mining out copper and iron, diamonds, all of these resources having them work in manufacturing and taking all that manufacturing back to China in order to sell it wholesale at prices that undercut industries around the world. Most of the directors seem to be in general agreement about one detail about China. It's not the central government which poses a threat. It's not just the central government which poses a threat to the United States, but the entirety of the population of the country which is leveraged, if not forced, to do their bidding in the interest of breaking down the strengths of the United States, in interest of bringing China into the position of hegemon of the world. Chinese investment and trade policies worldwide are focused not on fair trade, but rather the invasion of markets and enforcing influence by way of money and tools necessary to remain competitive. Through what amounts to slavery of their own people, working in manufacturing, and well-placed hardware and software, which allows them to surveil and take control of nearly any device in China, as well as most of the devices that make their way out of China, in the hands of consumers or corporations, sold at prices severely undercutting the market, China has essentially created their own spy network out of those who can't afford to buy an iPhone or a Galaxy S8 and giving them nearly as much access to the communications of any American they deem as useful as the NSA has in themselves. This, of course, goes without saying, they can do the exact same to anyone who is on their mobile networks in Africa, anyone in China without question, anyone who has their hardware in Japan, South Korea, North Korea, they are remarkably in control at this point. They can surveil anyone and the intelligence community has to fight tooth and nail against this and at the same time their hands are tied about even talking about it. If you go through and watch the C-SPAN video of this hearing, which will be linked down below, you'll realize that when they come to talking about issues of China, most of this information is extremely classified, despite the fact you can find information about it all over the internet, where Chinese citizens have been able to break free, whether by talking on um, VK, I know I'm not saying that correctly, uh, the Russian Facebook equivalent, uh, speaking on Twitter when they're able to find loopholes in the Chinese firewall, as well as South Koreans, Japanese citizens, and uh, uh, Chinese Americans who are against the Chinese regime, explaining just how insidious their system of infecting and controlling and surveilling everyone is through the use of software and hardware. Add to this the amount of money invested into universities and high schools by China, through the Confucius Institute program. Naivety on the part of academia as a whole, and they are remarkably naive, especially when it comes to the idea of getting money, has made them ripe for exploitation. Not only do these Confucius Institutes provide a stepping stone from which propaganda and outright lies regarding China enter our nation, but they also provide a stepping stone back to China for research, even classified research. 
They influence public opinion by spreading misinformation to vulnerable students, and they use those students to obtain research information they would not otherwise be able to accomplish themselves, sending it back home to be applied as cheaply and quickly as possible in their ongoing cyber espionage and financial war with the United States. As if China's state and military-backed business interests weren't enough, there's also the lingering issue of the tiny, tyrannical state that hangs off China's northeastern border, North Korea. While the mainstream news outlets focus on the ongoing exchange of threats between President Trump and the so-called supreme leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, the growing threat of direct cyber attacks from the rogue state, from their work in setting off false, false alarms in Japan, Hawaii, Alaska, and other locations, to the constant attempts to steal sensitive information not only for themselves, but as a means to trade with China to remain in their good graces, makes North Korea's cyber espionage threats a very real concern. Not to diminish their nuclear and non-nuclear threats, uh, which they do pose minds, with American military bases in Japan, South Korea, Guam, and Samoa within range of North Korea's missile strike capacity, they pose one of the most direct physical threats to American interests and, should North Korea make the foolish mistake of attacking one of these locations, one of the few nations in the world sta that makes them one of the few nations in the world standing at the precipice of dragging the rest of the world through uh, allies, uh, uh, alliances, and agreements into a devastating war. North Korea has also pursued chemical and biological weapons in their attempts to make themselves a militaristic superpower, even at the expense of their own people. While North Korea has played nice, even taking part in, un in a march under the reunification flag with South Korea at this year's Winter Olympics, it does not appear to be entirely willing on the part of South Korea, as Kim Jong-un uses his nuclear and biological weapons cache to coerce and influence South Korea. Having a nuclear umbrella is a very powerful negotiation tactic, and this reunification angle of being so supportive and kind to North Korea is very new for South Korea. Uh, the, previous, um, uh, the previous president of South Korea and the current president of South Korea are far more lenient and willing to put up with the abuses that North Korea puts on them as well as North Korea's own people in a manner that comes as extremely surprising to me. And it really makes me wonder just how terrified they are of North Korea's nuclear umbrella. Given the limitations of intelligence gathering with regards to North Korea, it's pretty hard to know precisely what Kim Jong-un is thinking with regards to the American sanctions and policies regarding the, his rogue state. However, the entire intelligence community remains concerned that Kim Jong-un is acting from a position of resistance against possible regime change or regime collapse. This isn't a nation which operates like modern democracies or republics. It operates far more like a, uh, well, I want to say a dictatorship, but this dictatorship takes it the extra mile. And if you know anything about dictatorships, uh, the, one of the main reasons that dictators don't invest in roads or schools or even food for their citizens is because most, if not all, of their money has to go towards paying off and filling the coffers of the military generals, the people who keep the di the di uh, the you know the head ruler, the supreme leader in power, because if they're not giving that money to the military generals, to the businessmen who negotiate and uh, keep them in trade with other nations, well, that's when you start seeing the possibility of military rule and a coup. It would now. This is an. If Kim were killed, it wouldn't. It would immediately. Excuse me. It would immediately open up the country to military rule by the generals which surround him, and wait for the day they could implement their plans without the tug of the leash that the Kim family has held over them for so long. 
But if keep, Kim does not keep pouring money into their pockets, uh, and instead chooses to, you know, use his money to buy more than one potato a month for his citizens, well, then the threat of a military coup becomes more real. Not Americans killing Kim Jong-un, but the military generals killing, them, killing him themselves, and then implementing their strategy of total war against South Korea, against Japan, and against the United States, becomes far more real. And a military coup would not well end well for any of those nations. Now, it wouldn't end well for North Korea either, because once, if Kim is taken out of power, there's nothing stopping China from marching in, and there's nothing stopping Russia from marching in. Let alone, there's nothing stopping Americans from doing flyovers by the fucking day and turning the entire north half of that peninsula into glass. Unfortunately, Democratic senators on the Intelligence Committee were very quick to ignore any attempts to focus on China and North Korea. Taking up nearly the entire last hour of the discussion with the directors to, d to address Russia and corruption within the FBI. Issues I'll be addressing in upcoming videos. With all eyes on Russia with regards to cyber espionage and the upcoming midterm elections, it seems even our Senate has no interest in paying attention to the threats coming from elsewhere. I certainly hope none of the senators running for re-election have Huawei or ZTE phones. Thank you for listening, and I'll catch you in the next video, in which I'll probably be talking about the FBI. Mm -hmm.